I'm Carol Lloyd, Executive Editor at Great Schools, and today we're going to be talking about elementary school math and how to help your child. We have two really great resources with us today. One is we've just launched a new collection of videos that show what success looks like for math, reading, and writing from kindergarten through fifth grade. And we also have an expert with us. Um, Greg Coleman is an instructional coach uh, for e elementary school math teachers, and he runs a blog called Mr. Elementary School Math. So when we found his blog, we knew that he would be the right person for us. Welcome, Greg. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So um, we're going to talk about these milestone videos a little bit. Um, but first, I want to ask you, in your experience, what is the single most important thing that you wish parents understood about helping their children with elementary school math? So there are several, but if I had to wrap it up all into one thing, I would say in elementary school math, it is important for students to have number sense. And I remember being asked the question, what is number sense? Number sense is so many things. It can be, uh, so I'm just going to give an example of what number sense would look like. So many parents have gone to the store and many have gone with their children. Imagine going to a store and you purchase an item that costs $3.78. However, the cash register, as soon as you get to the cash register, the cash register goes down. I'm sure many of us have experienced that. I know I have. But the register, the person behind the register will think, hmm, I don't know if I can really solve this without, uh, without the computer. So they'll grab a calculator. So one of the things we want to do for our children is we want to infuse great number sense. So we don't want them to get behind that register if they were working as a, a teenager in a store and think, oh, I cannot solve this problem. We want them to solve it. So an example would be if the child was given $5 uh, from one of their patrons, if the parents went there, and uh, the item costs $3.78, the kid could think of how could I solve this without this computer? So one of the ways is they have to be flexible in their thinking. They have to really think through and rationalize. So one of the ways they could think about it, if you have no paper and pencil, you could think of how can I count up? So if I start at $3.78, how can I end up at $5? Which is what many adults do. Um, so one of the ways that we teach kids in elementary is to think about these numbers as being connected. That's part of number sense too, thinking about how they're all connected. So $3.78, my example. Let's go down to $3.80, which is two more cent. Next, I can hop over 20 cent to get to $4. So I'm at 22 cent between $3.78 and $4. Next, I get from $4 to $5, which is a dollar. So my change is $1.22. And that's one of the things that we try to get kids to really understand how to think about numbers and how they're all related. So that would be a really good example of a child really establishing and getting a good sense of numbers by seeing how they're all connected. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of what parents can do is in their everyday lives ask the kids to participate in those practical decisions so that they get used to it because we all learn it eventually. But if the kids learn it from an early age, then they can really build on those skills and have more advanced skills later on. Absolutely, absolutely, and they all bill, all the skills in elementary school bill for a great student in middle school and a great student in high school, but the foundation is really laid in elementary with having a great sense of number and what that means and how can we break down and build up numbers. So um, I wanted to talk to you about, you picked out four videos. I did. Us, um, from our collection of 60-some uh, videos, and um, the first one that you um, that you picked out is one that shows, it's called, Does Your First Grader Understand Tens and Ones Places? And that, yes. again, is taught, speaking to that number sense issue. Um, this shows kids building up to 10 and moving down to 10. Just at kindergarten level, using all different kinds of um, tools. And we're going to have the link to that video on our Google Hangout page and also on our YouTube page. But I wanted to, to ask you, why did you think that this was an important video for parents to watch? So I love that first grade video because as I go back to thinking about my experiences with students as well as teachers, one of the things I think about in the example, it really shows how 49 is 
different than 94, but yet 94 is bigger than 49. So what kids in first grade are beginning to start to think about is how are these, the magnitude of these numbers, how are they the same, but how are they different? So what we're trying to get our kids to really think about is, oh my goodness, 94 and 49, even though the digits are in reverse, because we have a 4 first and a 9 second and 49 and a 9 first and a 4 in the latter column in 94, we want to get them to see that these two numbers are different. And how can they really see the differences and be able to explain it? So for example, there's a lot of first graders who have a difficult time with those type of reversals with numbers. So what we do is we use models and we use base 10 blocks to have the kids build it. So they'll build 49 and then the kids will see, okay, I have four tens and nine ones. Now let me compare that to my 94, which is nine tens and four ones. So we really are trying to get our kids to really get the understanding that nine tens is ultimately larger than four tens, and that's what makes the numbers bigger. So all of this is connected to get our kids to really understand the differences between the tens and ones place, and that ten ones equal a ten, and in second grade, ten tens equal a one hundred. We're trying to get them to look at numbers and really seeing them as real life things, and how does that? How can we make sense out of that? So, um, the other video that you, another video that you recommended was the first grader video called uh, "Does Your First Grader Understand Tens?" Sorry, does your second grader add and subtract numbers up to one hundred? Why is the that such an important skill? What do you think is significant about that video for parents? So uh, speaking to that, it's all connected. I thought that was an excellent video because it connects the place value understanding of like, for example, four tens and nine ones, and now we're adding and using operations to add and subtract with that place value understanding. So I have like a little model here. I don't know if you can see it very well. You know, the teacher in me always goes to visuals. I like visual models. So in one of the examples, it really showed a student doing this model, which is 36 and 24. So what the student was doing was they were adding their tens first. So they said 30 and 20 is ultimately 50, and 6 and 4 is 10. And then they combine the 50 and the 10 to get 60. So what this does is really reinforce place value really well because now I see that 3 is not just a 3 ones, but I see it as 30. Whereas sometimes students will think, oh, wait a minute, that 3 ones, that might be just a 3. And they'll say that. But think about the way that we taught math before. Growing up, I know I learned math just this way. And this is called what I call the traditional algorithm. And how I see it is, OK, we start in the ones place. And teachers used to say that. But math is flexible. We do not have to start in the ones place. So if we use this example, adding 6 and 4, we would get 10. But oftentimes what uh, a child will say is, this is a 1. And this is not a 1. Mm -hmm. And that's the place value in it. It's worth 10. So this is a 10 plus a 30 plus a 20 gives me 60. And that's how you can really see that. So, so you're showing about how the traditional algorithm, if kids don't understand the meaning behind it, yes. they can get sort of on, off track and be permanently off track and always think of that, that, that the uh, extra numbers that they're carrying over aren't moving into a different place value. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what we see is what the standards are doing now is it really gets the kids to explain. They have to use models to really determine, and it's getting them in the lower grades, specifically K, kindergarten, first, and second, to really understand place value. So what this is, with our traditional way didn't really show place value that much because kids still saw this as a one. Now we're starting to get them to see that this is really 30 and a 20, and my one is really a 10 because it comes from the six plus four equals 10. So it's really getting them to connect the place value and to understand that a lot better than they used to. You talked to me a little bit earlier about second grade and about how important um, and difficult subtraction is. I think for a lot of parents, when you come out the other side, you kind of understand subtraction. I was surprised to hear that that's a skill that a lot of kids struggle with. Do you, what, what can you say about that? So subtraction, and I'll go back to uh, one of my, my first examples about building number sense. Subtraction is a very difficult thing for us students. And I was recently reading a book, uh, Number Sense Routines, and with uh, Number Talks also. 
And what it really talks to is having a child really think about the number. Think about the example I gave earlier, which is $5. You're taking $3.78 from $5. But take out the decimals, and let's look at that as 500 and 378. Children will see that 500, and they'll look at the 378 and sometimes think, oh, I cannot subtract 8 from a 0, and I don't know what to do. So going back from the traditional algorithm and really getting them to understand numbers, really getting them to really see the connectedness. So I have <laughs> another model, yeah, number right. line. Uh, you know, I, I'm a model person. I love models. So the number line really shows the connectedness with numbers. So here was my example earlier, $3.78 and $5. So it really shows them the connectedness with the jump. So we started $3.78. So if I just took out the decimal and said $3.78, then I skip two numbers and get to 380, and then I skip 10 numbers from, well, a 20 from 380 to 400, and now I have 20 here, and now I have from 400 to 500, and that's 100 numbers. So really, we could see subtraction as a way of counting up. We oftentimes think of subtraction in only one way, and kids see them as just digits. I'm just subtracting this digit with this digit, and they don't see the numbers as a whole. Like, they don't see difference between 378, all subtraction is doing is asking me how many numbers are between 378 and 500? And I know many parents see that with their kids. Their kids probably would have a hard time saying, hmm, 378 and 500, how many numbers are between that? And if we phrased it subtraction in that way, I think kids would get a better understanding of what that really is. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is see how many numbers are between and getting them to a process that will effectively allow them to solve that. Yeah, and it only gets worse when they hit middle school and high school and they become addicted to their calculators. Oh my goodness, it does. And then it, it leads to sometimes as adults, what we'll say is, oh my goodness, I don't know how to do the mathematics. Like, for example, uh, recently, <laughs> you know, as adults, we often hear that quite a bit. Like, I was, we were looking at uh, a real estate agent to give us an appraisal on the, our home recently. And pretty much what the real estate agent said is, oh my God, I'm not a good mathematician. I need my calculator to determine the square footage and the unit per square foot feet. And that was so interesting because it involved math, because math is all around us, you know? Absolutely. So your, the, the other video that you discussed was, can your third grader do word problems with multiplication and division? One of the things these videos really focus on is a, a lot of every single grade has a word problem focus uh -huh. and has a video devoted to word problems. So wh why is that important? Why is there this emphasis on word problems now? What, what's, what's behind it? And if it's driving your child crazy, wh what can you do to help them with it? So that's a great question, Carol. So I think about word problems in the totality. So now with our uh, standards, well, we're moving towards a more word problems versus computation. Before, what we would do oftentimes is when I say computation, I'm saying something like uh, th 3 plus 2 equals 5. That's just an equation. Now, what will happen is we're driving more to a word problem where the words are uh, pretty much, the numbers are embedded in the words. So it could be like, uh, John has three apples. He went to the store and uh, picked out two more. How many apples does he have now? So it's really getting the kids to look at the context and look at the math behind it, but it, it involves a lot of words. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes what I've noticed is kids really, really have a difficult time with differentiating all of the words from the numbers. So it's funny that you said this because I recently wrote a post on problem solving. I called it Problem Solving One on One. So one of the strategies that we use is typically to solve problems, we first read the problem without the numbers because we're really looking at a reading issue to a large degree because now we're infusing reading with mathematics and now we have to really decipher what is this really asking so a first read of the problem would say let's take out all of the numbers and I'm just going to read the problem without the numbers just to get a context of what is happening here so one thing that a parent could do is just take out the numbers out of the problems and then they can say okay just tell me what's happening what did you read what did you understand because basically we want to get a main idea of what's happening. Now let's put back our numbers in the problem, you know, and then let's see, read it again. Does it change? No, it really doesn't change that much. So really what we have to do is get our kids to act out problems so we can have them uh, demonstrate it, you know, around us. S tell us, show me, prove it to me. We can have them read the problems without the numbers in it as a first read and a second read and then 
read it a third time with the numbers in it to see if they have understanding. So I really, it really helps a lot of parents too because I think sometimes when parents are helping a kid who's struggling with math, they don't know what the problem is, and if they went through that process that you're just just describing, I can imagine them realizing, oh, my child doesn't have a math problem. They're having a reading problem. Yes. And yes. that's a different issue. And it's coming up in math. It's a, it's a manifesting during their math homework. But it's not really about their number sense. It's exactly. about their reading. And that's a really important discovery for a lot of parents. And I absolutely agree with you, uh, Carol, because we see that quite a bit uh, at the schools that I uh, work with, that there is ultimately a reading issue going on more than there is a math problem, math or computation or number sense understanding. So really getting our kids to really infuse and our teachers really to infuse how can we use the words and the numbers and blend them together and come up with an approach that will work. We just look at, okay, let's look at some reading uh, strategies that we can use. So that's where I came up with that, thinking of, okay, this is a reading strategy and this works good with reading. So if we can get the kids to understand what is the main idea of this problem, then we could get them to really think about the problem with the numbers. That's great. Um, the final video that you chose was, uh, does your fourth grader multiply two-digit numbers? Um, is that an important milestone? Is that something that's a big jump for a lot of kids to go from that single digit focus, building of skills? It's really focused on automatic learning and really memorizing those to two digits. No one's expected to know their two digits by heart. So what, what's, that, what's that jump like for kids and what's the best way that a parent can help? Okay, so as I think about the jump in kindergarten, first and second grade, typically students will focus, the focus is really on addition and subtraction and really building the addition and subtraction. Then in third grade what happens is students really have to understand multiplication because a good part of third grade is understanding how multiplication and division are related. So at the end of second grade, typically most of depending on the, di the districts, what will happen is there is a unit on multiplication. So it's really getting them to understand that multiplication is nothing more than repeated addition. So three times five is three groups of five. So that's five plus five plus five, three groups of five. And then move into third grade to really saying how can I work with this, these facts to really solve problems. So there's a lot of work done in third grade with just single digit. And what the standard typically says is they have to understand how to solve problems to a hundred. So that means what we got a sense of is that means 10 times 10. They have to know the effects up to 10 times 10. So one thing that parents can definitely do is have their kids practice facts. They can practice them through songs. They can do songs like 2, 4, 6, 8. I'm at the 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. You know, so do things with beats. I hear a lot of things on television and things on uh, about music, how music really helps to infuse and build brain capacity and really help to bridge learning. So we can have our kids skip count our facts. They can do that in the car or there are games that parents could do and think of, hmm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, two different numbers that multiply to get to 15. Can you give me those two different numbers? Mm -hmm. So make it fun for kids. So that will ultimately build to fourth grade and up. So in fourth grade, that's where they start building on to two-digit by two-digit multiplication. They do three-digit by one-digit multiplication. In fifth grade, they're doing uh, multi-digit uh, multiplication as well as division. So building that understanding in uh, fourth grade or before that is really important. So a simple thing that parents can do is help make multiplication fun for your students. Have them practice it. Have them uh, do different things with it. Um, so that's one of the things that really can help and make it make sense um, is one of the things that and, and make sure it you know the math makes sense pretty much so we have to really think about this whole thing of number sense does if I think about something like say like a two digit we start with uh, something like tens because typically a benchmark number kids know with tens so if I start having them multiply certain things like five times ten they'll get that fifty six times ten sixty so let's go beyond that. Let's talk about 12 times 10 because there are patterns. 12 times 10 is 120. Now we're starting to talk about two digits and two digits. Let's talk about 13 times 10. That's 130. What do you see happening here? 
So then ultimately we can have them think about this and not with money too. 25 dimes is how much? 25 dimes is $2.50. So have them think about it in terms of money too. Let's connect dimes, which is which you know worth 10 cents, with what we do. Mm. So we can make connections for our children so they're better able to understand this concept. So um, one of our viewers, Jessica, is asked, wonders what your favorite resources are for parenting, uh, for parents helping their fifth graders with math homework. Because it's a big jump after fifth grade. Math changes a lot in sixth grade. So Ooh, what, do you, what do you think are the main things that parents should, should sh kind of the kind of resources they can help, help okay. with? That's a good question. Tell her that's a great question. So here is my, I have another chart, guys. I'm <laughs> full of charts today. <laughs> so one of my favorite resources is uh, www.learnzillion. Learnzillion is an extraordinary website. Parents can sign up their students, or I think they can sign up as a teacher as well. What you can do there, there are videos. There are great, great videos that have every, pretty much every standard in them. So you'll have every standard, and you'll see videos on how that should work. So show your children that video as they get home. That's a great homework help. Another resource that probably many people have heard, I think it, was, it has come out of California, is Khan Academy. So a gentleman in 2006, uh, Salman, I think his name is Khan, he pretty much established Khan Academy. So Khan Academy is great because I think what he was trying to do was help his nephew in New Orleans. He was finding a way to bridge the math in New Orleans from California to say, how can I get my nephew to better understand this? So Khan Academy is another re uh, great resource for parents. There is another resource because it has videos on how to do the math, and you can show your children that. So to me, those are two great, great resources because it has videos to really help support the parent and then ultimately the students. So the kids can look at the videos and really to have the parents say, okay, now explain what you see in the video to me. How would you break that down into your own language is what a parent could do with their child. So those are two great resources uh, that parents can use to really Wait. help get the math. And we'll put those resources on the Google Hangout page so that we have them all. I see that you have a couple more there too. Yeah. We have a couple more reader question, uh, viewer questions. Okay, great. Um, one mother is asking, to Jolly is asking, my second grader is clearly good at math, but she constantly complains that math is boring. Any mm -hmm. suggestions to keep her interested? So one of the things that kids, uh, that I see the kids love, they love games. Think about it. Uh, kids are absolutely, uh, they're intrigued by games, video games. Uh, we used to play hide and seek oftentimes. That was a game we loved. So we can make math fun by having a game. So one thing that the parent can do is they can have different number games that they play with their, uh, the children. So, for example, what uh, that parent could do is think about when they're in the car. They can say, hmm, as I'm passing by, you know, ser several traffic lights, I wonder how many traffic lights we see. I wonder how many trees, how many leaves are on that tree over there. So we can make it meaningful. Another thing we can do is do what we do in everyday uh, life. Uh, we cook, right? So have uh, your child help you cook. They can see fractions. And with the cooking, you can really talk about time really largely because with great cooks, you have to be really efficient with time. So have your child uh, determine how much time do we need to finish cooking this ham or turkey or something like that. We can do games like the parents can think of like an example of uh, guess my number. I absolutely love that. This is something I think about um, often. So what the parent could do is say, okay, I'm thinking of two numbers that add up to 24. Give me those two numbers. I'm thinking of two numbers, and the difference is 10. Give me those two numbers. Give me as many as you can. And how did you get that? Prove it to me. So those are some strategies that parents can use and make math fun and meaningful. Do you have any um, recommended uh, board games or card games that you think are really uh, good for building math competency? So I would say the, the thing that I would use probably a deck of cards to do is I would probably play something like War. So I would probably get a, just a regular deck of cards and have the parent or another child play against the, uh, another child. And what they can do is each uh, member has, you take out all of your you know, high cards like king, queen, those cards, and you have the ones that have values on it like two, three, four, five, and have the kids and the parent or whoever 
uh, the first one, they, they each have a set of cards. So I would lay my card down, and then the child would lay their card down. The first person or who can multiply those efficiently, they get the deck. They get those two sets of cards. So though I would say things like that. Um, I'm not a big chess. Multiplication chess war. Multiplication war is great. Um, I hear chess is excellent too. I'm not much of a chess person, but I hear that really uh, has strategy. This is what I would suggest to parents: any game that infuses strategy into it, like Uno. I would say Phase Ten. Any games that really relate to strategies really will help kids thinking because ultimately what we're trying to get them to do is be our kids to be critical thinkers. We want them to be great thinkers. So if we could get them thinking really well, then they would do well. Last question. Uh, Leo has a father of an advanced child in math and he's really working way above grade level yes. and he's not necessarily that challenged in his school right now. So what's the best way for um, for a parent to work with the teacher to get their child the kind of the challenges that that he needs. So one of the things I would definitely say um, to the parent is make sure through your parent and teacher conference one of the things that you really need to communicate is your student's strengths. So really knowing what your student's strengths are. So if I think the child's name was Leo, you said, or well, that's uh, the father's name. The father's name. So if Leo could have his uh, know what his pretty much his student strengths are, his child's strengths are. So if that means that they're really good in multiplication, really good in division, really moving on to the next thing would be a definitely fractional understanding because fractions and division are really very much related. So he has to really go with the understanding of what his child is good with and then go, you know, approach the teacher and say, okay, well my kid really understands these things very well and based on the things that I'm seeing you send home, they're understanding these things pretty well. Could you give me some extensions for my child, so that's the first avenue I would definitely say. Uh, meet with the teacher and ask for them to help and give some extended work. So as well as their foundational work, which uh, the child I'm sure does very well in, they can ask for some extra work that will help meet those needs. Um, that would be the first avenue or the first line of defense is really meeting with the teacher and really having a sense of where the child is or and really saying how can we come up with a plan together to build my child. So usually uh, teachers are very good about saying, okay, this is what I can do or this is what I cannot do. So one of the things um, that the parent could also do is they can get some activities that um, the kid really can work with at home. There's another website called K5 Math Teaching Resources that have different centers and activities on it that would help uh, Bill. So if their kid is in, I don't know what the, the child of grade level is, if they're in third grade, they can really look at maybe fourth or fifth grade materials and really infuse that into what they already know. Or another thing that the parent can do is ask the teacher, can can my child or can I talk to a, the grade level above, say for example if their child is in third grade, can I talk to, can you give me a good teacher in fourth grade that I can talk to and maybe I can get some extra work from that teacher and I can help my child at home as well with? So that's, those are some things that could help. So in terms of, um, you've mentioned the new standards a few times, and I know a lot of parents are pretty uh, confounded by homework that's coming home that seems so different from what they experienced. And I know the math that I'm seeing my daughter come home with is completely different than what I was taught. Yes. So um, if your child is struggling, and you don't even understand the principles behind what they're being asked to do, what's the first thing you should do? The first thing that I would do, and this is what we have done with teachers at uh, the school that I work with, we have asked teachers to send home an example of the strategies that you're looking for with the homework. So what is fair for a parent to do is to approach the teacher and meet with the teacher and say, look, I'm having a difficult time with some of these strategies because clearly I didn't learn this way, you know, and the teachers oftentimes didn't learn this way. Could you send home uh, with the homework a list of strategies and how to do those strategies so I can better support my child at home? And that really works really well. We've seen that work pretty well um, at the school that I work at uh, in terms of having teachers really send home different examples or different strategies to help meet those specific needs because I think that's where the gap lies. The strategies are so different from what was uh, what parents learned uh, that there's really needs to be a bridge to really better understand that. So that's one of the strategies, just having 
the teachers come up with different, you know, the strategies that they're teaching, have it on a sheet, and they can send it home with the homework. That's a great idea. And the other thing, obviously, is go on to milestone, our Milestones page and, and check out the videos for your child's grade level. You can look up a grade level, down a grade level, and try to see if you're seeing your child in these, in these little videos of real children. They're not actors. They're real kids working at their own grade level with their own teachers and sort of uh, demonstrating a lot of these kinds of new strategies and skills that Greg has been talking about. Absolutely. So that sped by. That was great. I'm so glad that you were with us, Greg. Um, Thank you. I appreciate your time, and um, I think a lot of people will be uh, asking you questions in the future. So if you want to get on our Google Hangout page and continue the conversation, we encourage you to do so. In a couple of weeks, we have another milestone viewing party, this time about writing with author, teacher, writer, Melissa Taylor. And that will be February 26th, 11 o'clock AM Pacific Standard Time. So I appreciate all of your participation. Thank you so much, Greg. And I look for you out on your, um, on your, on your blog, Mr. Elementary School Math. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it.